Good evening and salam. I am Miriam Afalabi, a member of the MacFest team, and I'm delighted to welcome you to MacFest 2021. This evening, we are thrilled to host an exciting panel who will be speaking about challenging racism in the photography industry. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our host for this panel, Dr. Becky Alexis Martin, who is a lecturer at, of geography at the Manchester Metropolitan University. I'd like to share a few words about her. Dr. Becky Alexis is um, an award-winning Pacific academic, writer and photographer. She has expertise in visual ethnography. She works to support the voices of the communities that she collaborates with, with a focus on the autonomy and human rights. Our topics have included the necropolitics of Uyghur Muslims oppression in Xinjiang, a city in China, and the need for recognition of the people of Kiribati in light of the climate crisis. Before I hand over to her, I would like to add that the audience please um, follow MacFest on their social media sites of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so you can be notified of our future events. Thank you very much, and over to you, Dr. Becky. Thank you so much, Mariam. That was such a superb introduction um, and it is a pleasure to be here um, and to the opportunity to introduce two exceptionally special guests um, for this very special evening event. Um, it's um, particularly important, I think, um, as it's going to explore racism and photography and Black Lives Matter, um, which, as we know, are these huge issues um, that we're trying to kind of work with and find ways to kind of move forward with um, right now, you know. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our fantastic um, guests of the evening. Um, so firstly, um, I want to introduce um, Fuad um, Alak Barof. Um, he's a Glasgow-based um, photographer and he's a political commentator and he's a human rights activist. Um, his work and his interviews have been published in many magazines um, and newspapers, um, both nationally and internationally, um, including Open Democracy, um, Forbes Mexico, The Herald, The National, the BBC, um, Bella Caledonia, Visions of Azerbaijan, um, The Guardian um, and International Policy Digest. Um, and many others as well. Um, and he is noteworthy, he is famed for his work um, that um, exploring in particular um, refugee communities um, and um, also working towards understanding and photographing and photo documenting, I would say, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, so it's a pleasure to have him here um, with us today. And um, Mike Shaft um, might not need any introduction to some of you. If you're from Manchester, he really doesn't need an introduction. Um, he's an award-winning broadcaster of considerable repute in the Northwest. Um, and um, he was um, born in Grenada in the West Indies, and he's lived in the Northwest of England since 1968. So he's had this incredible broadcasting career and um, beginning in Piccadilly Radio um, in Manchester in 1978. Um, and um, within this extensive career, he's had recent highlights. So um, in October 2017, his um, breakfast programme on BBC Radio Manchester was named the best strand um, in the um, Jerusalem Awards. So he is also award winning. And he presents a fantastic multi-faith Sunday breakfast show on BBC Manchester. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, about yourselves um, before we begin? No, it's all good. Brilliant, it's been a fantastic. Fab job, a fab introduction, and uh, I will continue when once it's my turn. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, um, Fuad, would you like to begin um, by sharing your um, excellent talk with us today? Thank you. Um, hello to everybody and salam alaikum. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, the, um, the challenge of racism in the photography industry. Um, it's a broad topic and we will, I would like to uh, cover the um, important parts of racism in the photography industry. And I hope you'll find this uh, very, um, what do you call it, um, quite interesting. And before I start, uh, I would like to talk about my background. Um, as I've said before, uh, my name is Fouad Alakbarov. Um, I have born in Baku, Azerbaijan. 
Uh, it's a small country for those who doesn't know. There's a lot of stereotypes. Oil, gas, Eurovision. That's what Azerbaijan is well known in the UK. But it's actually a very diverse place. It's a kind of on the crossroads between Russia and Iran. And um, I started uh, photography at the age of 13. So when my father gave me my first camera, I used to take photos of myself as a child. Then that kind of grew into the passion. Then that kind of evolved towards photojournalism. So today um, I will talk about uh, some of the experience I had uh, during dealing with the racism, as well as my background, um, which I uh, hope you'll find interesting. So the first thing, um, as a photographer, I dealt with a lot of cases and um, some of the stuff that I've seen was pleasantly surprised me while other stuff uh, was quite shocking because I thought this shouldn't be happening in the 21st century. So 20 years ago, um, when I started, um, there was not so much awareness about uh, racism in terms of photography, at least from UK. And this is from my personal perspective. I mean, you might feel uh, you, you feel free to disagree on that. Um, but when I've started, especially when I was doing a lot of wedding photography, I've saw a lot of racism. And this was kind of casual racism. Um, you'll see, like, I don't want to take um, some of the uh, photography colleagues I've saw said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't take uh, these people's photos because they might not look well. And when they meant that, they meant um, skin tones or maybe their backgrounds or maybe some of the dresses they had, as well as uh, you'll see a lot of these common uh, phrases, which is very racist, saying these people shouldn't be in this photo. Basically, uh, lots of um, racism and kind of uh, stigmatization towards people from uh, non-white background, uh, primarily. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people and a lot of my colleagues um, sometimes feel they need to be silent on this issue because they feel like um, by keeping silent, I don't want to lose my kind of customer base, which is not uh, good because these things can affect you as well. And so the guilt of silence is very important when we are dealing with this. And I used to be also guilty, and I like to be honest about that, by not focusing on this issue, saying, you know what, uh, maybe that is kind of uh, that industry works, you know, uh, maybe I am, you know, not understanding. But as I grew to the more, I've noticed um, this is absolutely unacceptable. And we all see in television, a lot of people getting harassed for their background, for the religion, for uh, other factors. Um, but the key thing is taking a first step and talking about that, because once you take action, uh, it's easier to kind of defend that. And you will see even your around uh, surroundings will um, you know, change to accept that reality. So we are um, like guilt of silence is very, very, um, you know, affecting us all. And I believe we should speak more because it's recently, as you have seen um, that in Black Lives Matter events, silence and violence, you know, um, if you shut your eye for it, um, they'll be like, um, things will not improve. Actually, it might get worse. And there's a great saying saying that uh, there's a special place reserved for the people who keep their neutrality during injustice. And I strongly believe in that. So we all need to speak out towards um, if we are seeing something that is not right. Because if you don't stand together for these people, tomorrow it might affect you or your loved ones. <clears throat> so photography is a very important tool. And um, as a result, we need to hold our industry accountable. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, if, if you're looking from fashion photography as well, I have worked with various models from various backgrounds, and that includes from all around the world. And unfortunately, fashion industry uh, is have a lot of uh, racial bias in it as well. Things, of course, moving towards the right direction, but it's moving very, very slow. So as a result, we need to kind of push in that. And I will later in this presentation, we'll talk about how we are trying to kind of, um, how we can basically tackle these stereotypes and how we can make our industry accountable. Um, it's very like, um, how do I say, we should like kind of 
not like cave back saying, you know, that guy is racist and that should, should go away. Um, it's important uh, to amplify our voices. And, and as a photography, which is a very important tool, um, I remember in 2016 when Alan Kurdi, uh, actually, I apologize, 2015, when Alan Kurdi, that Syrian uh, child who was washed ashore in Glasgow, I have held a, a protest, a vigil uh, for that child and thinking, you know, nobody will, uh, I mean, I'm going to stand for it, but a lot of people will not care. But will you believe that? 10,000 people in Glasgow and including um, like around 100,000 in Europe joined our event. It's called Europe Sees Syria. And there was so much anger towards, uh, towards racist uh, attitude of the British government, which uh, allowed a lot of children to suffer in the Middle Eastern, um, uh, like in Middle Eastern countries, as well as refugee camps all are uh, in the Europe. So if you go to Calais, and I have visited Calais quite a lot. Um, you will see a lot of people who are suffering uh, from um, a lot of stuff we take for granted. For instance, like some people cannot access soap or toilet paper or sanitary products for women. It's quite shocking to see in that this type of stuff in 21st century. And we all need to kind of um, take uh, responsibility as well because these people became refugees because of the wars that happened. And there's a simple solution for that. If you don't want to see a lot of refugees, do not make wars. So it's important. And that photo kind of changed whole perspective of Scotland. And as a result, I'm proud to say uh, I have worked with um, Scottish Minister of Justice back then, uh, currently, uh, uh, um, sorry, Scottish Minister of Europe. And currently, he's a Scottish Minister of Justice, Hamza Youssef. And Glasgow became the first city in UK to accept Syrian refugees. And now we hold more Syrian refugees than any other place of the UK. And when they arrived here, you had a lot of people saying, oh, these people will never gonna integrate and they will be never Scottish. But will you believe that? If you come to Glasgow now, you will see like a 20 Syrian stores. And according to statistics, 85% of these people are um, employed and they're actually from very well backgrounds, such as like a doctors, nurses, stuff that we need. And the UK uh, badly needs a lot of good specialists. So um, it's quite good to take a step. But may, my main advice to everybody, always take your first step. Uh, because once you take the first step, other uh, stuff becomes less easy. It's easier to dismiss stuff saying people are suffering from Middle East, people are suffering in Africa. Um, but taking action can improve somebody. I mean, we cannot help everybody, but we can help somebody. And I'm going to show you, um, like, you know, we must be actively anti-racist when it comes to it. You know, like Black Lives Matter uh, amplified uh, and made a lot of awareness about uh, some of the injustice that people are facing in uh, America, but actually in the world. I mean, sometimes we, we do get a lot of this... Um, poor stereotypes that all lives matter, which I strongly disagree, because Black Lives Matter is about equality, not saying somebody sh should be more important than others. So it's very important to distinguish um, the values. And uh, I always say, um, try to kind of take, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, actions towards it, work with uh, political groups, work with your uh, local council, work with refugee rights groups, with human rights groups. So there's a lot of um, uh, arena to help people out. And if you don't think photography is quite um, uh, uh, important, I will show you some of the photos that I have uh, found, uh, which was taken uh, during the civil, war, uh, civil rights movement. And some of the photos uh, um, I have to warn that a bit uh, might affect you, um, but it will show you how much is important. Like in this case, uh, civil rights demonstrator being attacked by the police dogs, very powerful photo. And it, it kind of like uh, affects people's uh, mentality that this is happening. Because one thing photography shows, it's a reality. It's a reality of history. And it's important to kind of, um, how do I say, um, we should basically help people uh, like uh, accountable. When, and in Scotland as well, recently when we had Black Lives Matter, a lot of people got abused by the police officers. Uh, we cannot allow that. The Sheku Bayo was a very well known, um, you know, person in the community was killed by police brutality in Scotland 
and will you believe that people will say oh, about USA, but this is happening in our own country. So it's important uh, for us to take justice. And now there's a lot of awareness going on. We are trying to kind of punish the perpetrators because if they do this again to somebody, it will uh, likely to happen to you or somebody you know tomorrow. And some of the photos you will see is quite like this is two terrified Afri African American girls had to flee police officers. You know, it shows quite a lot of uh, emotions. And one thing I found uh, amazing about photography, it shows emotions that can bring a lot of um, uh, vibes towards person and can change your reality. Uh, in case if you recognize this photo, it's also the cover of the Roots uh, hip hop group. Uh, they have used this uh, uh, like photography in their album, but it shows what, uh, where we came from and we cannot go back because um, we are like, we must move towards better future. And I want people to be colorblind for not judge people for who they are, uh, for what, which backgrounds they're from. They sh we should be judging people based on their character. Um, when I make mean, uh, ca character of their actions, I mean. <clears throat> and you will see a lot of sad photos such as like this, this girl um, bombed by the KKK. And now we see same stuff that happened in the USA. And we also have our own uh, Britain first and other type of um, racist groups like crawling around, uh, which is unacceptable in this day and age. Um, so some of the photos I would like to share, like a uh, like Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he was shot as well. Um, we need to kind of raise awareness as well of the some of these people that fought for the justice. I don't think there's enough um, um, public campaigns about people from different backgrounds, um, because um, as we can see in Black uh, History Month Festival, it's quite a good step, but I would like to see more kind of museums like in Liverpool, like a slavery museum, which shows about the how these people, which roads they went through um, to get some of the basic stuff we take granted. So it's very important to highlight that as well. And some more photos, um, you know, about being, um, people used to scare in Louisiana um, during this uh, time where a lot of people faced uh, discrimination. It's quite sad actually to see this as well. And, you know, this is all reality. It's not like show, it's, it, it can happen to us as well. And now you can see with Trump with the wall and others, and it, it's important to take back, but we, we can change that, you know? Um, if I, based on my experience, I have remember speaking uh, about uh, refugee, cam uh, refugee campaigns, and we used to have 20, 30 people used to attend these events. Now it will take like 300, 400 people and when I had a, actually a talk in Glasgow University, it was attended by 1,000 people, which shows, you know, if we are moving towards the right direction, but have we taken enough action? And that's the one thing I would like everybody to focus on. It's quite important um, to um, change people's lives. Again, we cannot help everybody, but we can help somebody. And that is what, what this is about. And um, photography is quite, um, how do I say, it can change lives, you know? So in order to tackle this stuff, you need to educate yourself, first of all. Sometimes we might think this doesn't affect us. Uh, we should be scrapped under the a carpet, but actually learning more about this stuff. And there's are plenty of books and nowadays internet, you can find about more, but you can educate yourself by attending some of the events in your local universities and local schools. So there's a lot of events. And if you cannot access for some reason, uh, there's a lot of events such as this, like a webinars. And I found this festival fantastic as well, the MacFest, because we need to celebrate this. Uh, we need to raise awareness about who we are. And the second thing, always listen to oppressed voices, because I believe uh, we have a lot of politicians who does the talk, but who doesn't listen to people. Because somebody who might be racist would not speak for me. He doesn't go for the same road or some of the harassment I have faced or my colleagues faced. Um, so it's important to listen to the people because by learning their stories, we will have a better understanding of them and better uh, methods to tackle these issues. The third thing, examine your own bias. How many of you will say you have never, um, like sometime, I'm not saying you should be racist, but um, some of the stuff you have fought, which now is not acceptable. So it's very important to also examine your own bias because we sometimes are guilty of that saying you know it doesn't affect me you know maybe that is not important but um, we should also put ourselves in somebody else's shoes 
because it, if it doesn't affect you, it doesn't mean it's not happening. And then keep striving to move forward. We all make mistakes, and but that's we need to kind of you should never be scared of speaking out. I strongly believe in that because by moving forward, we are changing things towards better. And as we can see, you know, like um, there's a lot of uh, awareness going on, like the Black Lives Matter events. Um, there's a lot of um, campaigns like refugees welcome campaigns. We need to push and we need to make things better, not only for me, not only for you, but for the future generations as well. And I'm happy to do that. So listen is very important part. You should listen um, to the people. And as I've previously touched in the points, the second point is donation. Um, donation is quite important. And I don't mean like exposing poverty. And I would like to touch this very briefly, but I think it's quite an important point. How many of us seen these celebrities going to the Africa, taking photos with people just to expose themselves? I mean, I'm not a fan of this stuff. And even when you, as a photographer, taking a photo of the homeless person, you need to seek permission because it might be okay for you to take the photo, but that person might not like to be seen like that. Um, so it's very important to have this model. I am aware some photographers might say, you know, it's, um, if they don't show this, how people know. So it's, there's a lot of moral ethics um, questions comes to this, but I believe it's important to speak to the person because some people do not want to be seen in this light because they might face even abuse as well. When you, especially you're talking about the people who suffered sexual abuse or some kind of domestic violence, it's very important to note that. The third thing is protest. You know, this is a photo I have taken um, actually last year in Black Lives Matter event in Glasgow. Um, protests have a very strong um, effect on people. It changes people. It, it also shows that we need to kind of um, change, we need to change stuff. But it's not enough about like getting a banner and saying, you know, I support this. It's, imp uh, it's very important to work with, this group, uh, uh, with a lot of groups, like anti-racism groups, to, uh, to make things better for everybody. So in, in Glasgow, when we had Black Lives Matter, it was a fantastic turnout we had, and it was a fantastic weather. And I think we had like a 30,000 people, which was shocking, because this was during the coronavirus, before the tires kicked in. But it's great to see... Uh, things are changing in UK towards better. At least I would like to believe in that. And uh, petition is another one. I mean, if uh, they are pushing, like uh, Scott, uh, the UK is the first country, and must, must be, some people will be shocked to hear this. The UK is the only country in the uh, Europe that have indefinite detention. And that means by people who are kept as a asylum seeker in indefinite detention centers don't know when they will get back which is actually shocking because you could call it like jail. You will see Yalswood Detention Center in London, which they keep people and a lot of people suffer a lot of um, emotional abuse, the physical abuse, and also like poverty. So your life is going away by sitting in this jail and you don't know you're gonna stay in this country or you will be sent back to uh, some dangerous country, which is uh, quite shocking. In Scotland, we also have Dangeval Detention Center, which I have visited a lot of times. It's called as uh, Scotland's Guantanamo Bay. And why is that? Because it's run by the same company, the Serco, who worked in the Guantanamo Bay. So it's very, very um, important to highlight this stuff. And we must all fight to shut these places because nobody should be treated like that. We're all human beings. Everybody should have uh, dignity when we are dealing with I, I believe strongly we need to have a dignified immigration system when we are dealing with this stuff. And diversify. Diversify is one of the stuff, it was, what makes us great. It's the food, I always like to say, even fish and chips doesn't uh, come from the UK, it came from Portugal, uh, from the Jew Jewish refugees uh, from Portugal. So like food, that what makes uh, uh, people uh, think better. So if you cannot bring some people who might be scared to talk, and from my uh, experience, a lot of people are scared uh, sometimes to speak to other people because they think you will try to change them. Or if you go to the mosque or, uh, or if you go to the church or if you go to somewhere, people will try to change you. But it's all come from the fear. But when it comes to food, you will notice people are tend to easy. Uh, they have an easy approach because they are, it's something they know. So we all know about like uh, 
various foods we have because UK foods without immigrants would suck, let's be very honest. And so it's very important uh, to bring other elements like a music that unites us, the sport. In Scotland, we have a, a, a some poly uh, fan clubs, which is very, very good with working a lot of people from the different backgrounds and standing against racism. And we also use a lot of food festivals to work with people. And it's, it's, it's quite fantastic because I believe food, music, sport unites people, not divides. And amplify your voices. Like, do not be silent. Please speak out. This girl, like Safia Khan, stood out against English Defence League in Birmingham, if I'm not mistaken. And if we don't stand for others, who will stand for us? You know, it's very important to take this. And I always like to uh, especially, especially highlight this because um, we are like, uh, we cannot make things change without taking action. Uh, and we need to also work not only on open racism, but some of the institutional racism we face in the work and maybe some other places, because um, by challenging this stuff, we are not only helping us, we are helping millions of people around the world. And thank you for watching this. I believe we all have a, we came from a long way to tackle this, um, racism and all other kind of discrimination, but it is possible. The history shows it is possible to change everybody. Uh, if you uh, don't like uh, look at the world as black and white, look with like a uh, rainbow colors. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Um I'm sure we're all in agreement um, that that is perhaps, well, that is definitely the best talk I've seen this year. So I'm afraid, Mike, you've got quite a lot to live up to when you talk next. Um, that was tremendous. Um, so I think to start the ball rolling, if it's okay with you, um, I've got a few questions. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about is your you know, reflecting upon the history of photography, you are working um, to try and, um, you know, make sure that um, that refugees' voices are heard, that they are seen, that they are witnessed. Um, and I was wondering, what has it been like for you, um, like, as a photographer behind the lens, how have you experienced kind of interacting with other photographers in the UK? Um, and have you personally experienced any challenges or racism during your work? I have been called a lot of, sadly, uh, spurts, which I would not like to kind of use, but um, that kind of made me stronger because, you know, they're all saying, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But uh, it's kind of sad to see this stuff happening. So as a result, I have uh, worked with Amnesty International and I also um, encourage everybody to do these lots of public talks because we need a lot of people to speak out for the people, especially in areas that are not diverse as some areas. For instance, if we look at London, it's very, very diverse. But if you go to Scottish Highlands, there might be some children who are suffering maybe from racism, but they might think that people might think that's accept accept acceptable because it's not diverse as in London, we don't have minorities. But I have actually went to some areas like villages of Scotland and now it's fantastic to see people are like saying, no, that is not okay. The racism is not okay. And it's very important to work with the children because the racism usually begins at the early stage. Because during the early stage, if we can comfort it, uh, discomfort it, if we can counter racism, it will change person towards better. And family also, unfortunately, plays a big role. But from my uh, photographer uh, uh, friends, uh, I'm very lucky and I'm very happy to say that a lot of my friends are very, very active and very vocal. And we usually do a lot of events as well. So sometimes we will make our events free so people can, from all backgrounds can come because we are trying to tell stories. And it's important to, during uh, behind the lens, um, tell a story because um, by, I mean, all, we all love selfies and we all do this like cliche photos, but it doesn't show the reality. It doesn't show the history because um, it's easy to kind of take photos in your warm home, uh, in your like a kitchen, um, in the club or even, but it's not easy to take a photo in the, the street, like which is in dark and it's in poor, uh, in poor condition in the, or food banks, which I, I believe it needs a lot of highlighting uh, because you are dealing first of all of shock that which I also faced like a, first of all, it could be like cultural shock as well if you're traveling to some other countries, because like if you travel into some of the countries, they have not even access to toilet systems. And it makes you think that 
no, it's not okay to have this. We must change, or at least we must do something to change this. And so I, I am very privileged, but photography brings a lot of friends. And one thing I love about photography, you learn a lot about food, which is actually makes me very happy. Like uh, it's, uh, I'm not like a gourmand, but uh, you have lots of people love photography for the, from perspective that is very diverse because we work with a lot of colleagues from different backgrounds, um, from various countries, as well as various like a social uh, class. And uh, it's important to collaborate and, and photography is a great arena uh, to work with a lot of people and we shouldn't be scared to speak to people, but it's important to highlight what do you want from them. It's very, very important. Thank you. That was such a good answer. Um, and um, I'm trying to decide now. I've got so many questions for you, um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our, our chat because we have already got people asking you all sorts of interesting and pertinent things. Um, so from Barbara in our audience, thank you, Barbara. Um, she wants to know, how did you get started in this work? So how did you become a photographer? What kind of fired you up? Um, but also, how did you get interested as a humanitarian activist? You know, all these wonderful things that you do. What inspired you? Um, I have started photography at the age of 13 when my dad bought me a camera. And I loved uh, art when I was a child, you know, because I always thought art is something, not perfect world, but it's something that speaks to me. It can also heal. And I have used photography as like a phototherapy because I was going through, I came from Azerbaijan to the UK. I was dealing with adaptation to this country. And when you don't have a friend, the camera was my best friend. So I took kind of a camera to take, uh, you know, photos of the Glasgow. So I've started taking photos of the nature and the street, but I found a street not uh, boring, but I found it's quite um, not my... It, I love people more. I love interviewing. So I spoke to a lot of people and I started with working with people from, um, you know, who are like a homeless and that kind of helped me to understand better. And then we worked with like a refugees and all these uh, people who are suffering injustice, but they are people like us and they are like a uh, fantastic people. And I'm happy to say a lot of people who I used to work, who used to be in streets or used to be in desperate situation are not anymore there. You know, they are doing well because there's like, we managed to help them to integrate to society as well. And I was integrating same um, to the society from like a economic migrant uh, because I was an economic migrant. But uh, I loved uh, working with people. And uh, when you learn, with, when you work with people, you learn so much about them. And if you're asking which photographers made a huge impact on me, it will be Stanley Green, who is a British photographer and worked with a lot of um, in war areas because in war, there is no like uh, winners and losers. There's only losers, unfortunately, but it uh, allows you to see that perspective from, you know, from not only from your side, but you see perspective from two sides. And sadly, I grew up in Nagorno-Karabakh war, which was a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And we had this kind of war. And when two nations are fighting, it's very ugly. Everybody's trying to show who is right. But in reality, the main losers uh, were like people because you see these people from this country is dying and same from other. And when the war finished, uh, people thought, oh, it's okay, it's gone. But unfortunately, recently, as we saw, it sparked again. Um, so it's important to keep your humanity because I always like to say humanity first, you know, people over profits. I totally agree. Um, that was, you know, exceptionally wise words. Um, and I'm a pacifist myself, so I couldn't agree more. Um, I think what I'd like to do now um, is, um, so we've got our very special guest, um, Mike Shaft, and um, he has some words to say himself. Um, so um, we're going to listen to um, his further um which, um, you know, addition to this, which will be really interesting. And then we're going to go back um, and we're going to have a really in-depth question and answers discussion um, together, um, all of us. So keep sending us these questions. Um, if you've got anything you want to ask either of our speakers, um, you know, just give us a message, give us a shout um, and we will ask it. Um, but without further ado, you've heard enough of me waffling. And um, so please may I introduce um, the indomitable um, Mike Shaft. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Becky. And thank you to the organization MacFest for uh, asking me to be here. It's a real pleasure. 
I've known about MacFest for many, many years, right from the beginning, because Keisha came into the radio station and spoke about it and told me all about it. And it being in Macclesfield, I couldn't understand that at all. You, Macclesfield's a tiny little area on the edge of Greater Manchester. And it started there and has uh, absolutely brilliantly been spread across the world, which is great to see. Now, uh, my presentation is slightly different from Fuad's because I want to widen it. I, I wasn't going to uh, compete with him on photography. So I know that. So uh, it's going to be slightly different. There are a couple of things I want to mention I, in tribute to Fuad. Probably my favorite saddest photo of all time was that child in Vietnam who'd been burnt with napalm. And it's a photo I will never forget. She survived and continues to live as far as I know. But the photo of then was just astonishing. And there's a photo of Martin Luther King where he's kneeling with some other people in prayer. And that's another one that's really got to me over the years. I've been lucky in the Manchester area. I came over here in 68 <clears throat> from Grenada, which as you mentioned before, um, is a beautiful island. I've only been back there once since I came to this country in 68. Uh, my one of my uncles passed away and I went back there for, for the funeral in 2015, I think it was. And it was exactly the same as I remember it. There were little roads that I remembered, little cut throughs. It was wonderful to go back there. And I took a photo on a beach there and it is one of my favorite photos. And if I get a chance, I'll switch the, uh, the background um, as we pr proceed. And you'll see that photo from Grenada. And every so often when I'm feeling lonely, I go and look at that photo. And it's it's nothing big, you know, it's uh, it was only taken with with a uh, uh, a phone, you know, and and it, it means something to me because it reminds me of my life back there. Fuad talked about his own photography. And I think one of the strange things now about photography is that everybody has a camera, and I mean everybody. And I know Fuad will hate me for saying this because professional photographers hate those of us who use our phones, but we do. I try and get pictures wherever I can. And I'm not gonna take the greatest photo of all time, but what I do take is some of the greatest photos for me, things, moments that I remember that are important to me. I said I want to widen this a minute a bit. <clears throat> I don't know if you know what the Shirley card is, first of all. The Shirley card, and I only heard about this when I started researching for this presentation. And in the olden days, when all these things were being invented, people couldn't get a perfect representation of black faces in photos. It was always not right too dark, too bright, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they had Kodak, which was the main company then doing film and film for uh, films as well. They had the Shirley card, which was to try and match so that they get a, re a proper representation of, of somebody's face. And in the end, they had to do away with the original Shirley card and invent a new one, which showed lots of different um, photos of different people and different, effectively different levels of whiteness, for want of a better word, or blackness. And it showed that all black people aren't the same black, all white people aren't the same black, aren't, aren't the same white. And these are things which are coming to light. As I say, I didn't know about it. Perhaps Fuad did, we may be able to tell us later. But we're all photographers now. And equally important, we're all videographers now every one of these phones takes video. And I think the world is changing because of this. Had it not been for people who were there at the time with their phones, would we even know who George Floyd is? Would we know? We know because those people had cameras, they took pictures, they took videos, and it was shared with the world. And I think that's a really important point to, to make. I'm a massive film fan, so don't be surprised by what I say here. There is a, 
a new film called The Dig. And it's a story of uh, an English woman living in the middle of the Southeast somewhere. And she has a huge plot of land, and I do mean huge. And there are mounds there. And she uh, wanted to know what was it under those mounds. And they have a dig. I won't be, provide any spoilers for you. However, and I love those films. I love those English films set back in the day where you saw the old life of, of England and Great Britain. And partway through that film, I began to hate it. And I will tell you why. Because I've seen Bridgerton. And if you haven't seen Bridgerton, take my word for it and look at it. It will change your life. And why is that? There is a belief that if black people didn't exist back then, you, you don't have to show it. So I couldn't see any black people in this film, The Dig, or people of color. There may have been somewhere I didn't see him. I apologize if I've got that wrong. What Bridgerton has done is to say, it doesn't matter what color you are or what time frame this is. If you were a great enough actor or actress, you will carry it off. You will make people believe that this is real. And they did it. And they had actors of the caliber of Ajoa Andoa, who's a British actress, absolutely brilliant in, in Bridgerton. Golda Rochevel, I hope I've got that pronunciation correct. A Guyanese stroke British actress, absolutely brilliant. And Reggie Jean Page, who is a British Zimbabwean. All these are people of color in this film, which is set in, I don't even think, it's the Regency period, which that's so long ago, right? And I don't know if there were black people here. If they were, they certainly weren't in the positions that they were portrayed in this awesome series. And I say, have a look at that. And I think it will change people's lives as we move on because people will be judged on their performance, not on their color. There are some black actors I don't like because they don't, they, they're not, they're not selling it to me, but there are white actors that don't, I, the actors I, I don't like because they're not selling me the, the, the part. The people in Bridgerton, whatever color they are, and they've been so carefully picked for the roles, they were magnificent. And I must give a mention to the executive producers uh, led by Shonda Rhimes. And if you don't know who Shonda Rhimes is, I recommend, recommend you find out. Uh, Betsy Bears, Chris Van Dusen, and Julie Ann Robinson. They were the uh, executive producers of Bridgerton. And you can see that they sat down and had these conversations before they got anywhere near writing the script and bringing this thing to life. And it was great to see actors of color in situations where in theory there shouldn't be but there was nothing wrong. It's okay, you know, we can all go <sighs> Wakanda forever and have black actors there. And that's not surprising, it's set in Africa and it's absolutely right. But to see the portrayals in Bridgerton set in those days in Regency England showed, in my opinion, what we've been missing over the years. Now I'm very lucky, I'm not gonna, take up a lot more time because I want to get to the discussion. Um, I'm very lucky leave, living in Manchester. I remember uh, speaking to somebody recently <clears throat> and saying, I thank God that I didn't go to America. Because when you lived in the Caribbean, you went either to America or to England, if you could afford it or some you had family. Uh, fortunately, my dad came over here to England before I did. 10 years later, my me and my brother and my mother joined him and we've been here ever since. He's now passed away as has my mom. But the importance of this country to me cannot be overstated. I haven't suffered terrible racism ever in my life. I have little bits. I remember working in a nightclub and I arrived one night and there were all these black people outside because they were mainly black crowd. 
And I said, what's going on? They said, they're not letting us in. And I went down, spoke to the manager and he said, yeah, it's getting a bit black. It's getting a bit black, um, too many. So we, 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 we'd like you to change the music. I says, I'm not prepared to do that. So I'll leave now. And I did. I remember once this guy on a bus calling me um, a black XXX. And I said, so what does that make you? He didn't have an answer. And I've always been, and I suppose I'm lucky because, because of it. I, I've got confidence in me. I've got confidence in Mike Shaft. And nothing you say or do is gonna change that in me. And I've been able to get jobs. Sometimes I've been for jobs and not get them, got them. I remember I tried to get into the RAF when I left school and I passed all the tests, went down to the regional center, passed all the tests there. And at the last interview, they said, we don't think you'd fit into the services. I said, okay, and walked out. Some years later, I was speaking to somebody who was a big high up in the RAF. And he says, oh yeah, in those days, we didn't let black people in. That's the way it was. I didn't let it stop me to do what I want to do. And if you think you're being stopped from that, build up your own confidence, have yourself on a pinnacle so that when they knock you down, they don't keep you down. Rise up and be the person you are meant to be. And remember my advice, watch Bridgerton and we'll discuss it another time. Thank you so much, Mike, that was tremendous um and um just a brilliant talk um, and you know what the rf didn't deserve you in my <laughs> um, far too good um, and um, it's just such an honor to have both you and fuad here to talk to us to share your experiences and to share your you know between you God, you must have what 30 40 50 years of experience in media and photography um so it's, a, it's truly an honor to have you here um so we've got loads of questions we've got comments i think rise up and be the person you are meant to be is just such a wonderful phrase just a wonderful way to describe things um and um i think perhaps that's a good way to begin the discussion um as well to kind of think about how you've risen up um and um kind of the challenges and opportunities that you've had um kind of during your career and during your lives and um, both of you that have kind of brought you to here today to this wonderful event oh I, I must just mention this by the way uh, yes. please do we, we had a small discussion before we started, before we began broadcasting and Black Lives Matter came up and I believe, and this is a personal belief, that Black Lives do matter. But where I differ from an awful lot of people is, I believe that's the case because all lives matter. That is where I think some people get the discussion wrong. And I understand my view is only my view. And you don't have to believe what I say or take it if you take it if you want it. But I think it's important that we understand that black lives matter because all lives matter. All lives matter. And we have to understand that and share that message. And that is my message. And, and other people have different messages. Thank you. That is a wonderful and powerful message, Mike. And I'm so glad that you're here to share it with us today. Um, and I think that it is really important that we listen, um, you know, to every community, that we listen um, to everyone to fight racism, to push back against discrimination and to make sure that we build a more inclusive society. Um, and, um, you know, it's a pleasure to hear, hear your thoughts. Um, so thank you. Um, so, I guess without further ado, um, shall we begin the discussion? Um, I think perhaps maybe, oh, where should we begin? Oh, perhaps uh, maybe it'd be interesting to kind of talk a bit more about the role of kind of people behind the camera um, as well and thinking about kind of your experiences and encounters um, while you've been working in media. So kind of what it's been like for you um, and the people you've worked with, Mike, if that's a good question to begin with. It's a brilliant question. I've been very, very lucky. I, I always say God looks after me because I'm one of his favorites and not everybody gets that. Um, I've been very lucky 
Um, as I mentioned, I didn't get into the RAF. Uh, it didn't stop me being who I wanted to be or would eventually become. I always wanted to be a radio presenter, always wanted to be a DJ. And I worked to that, towards that end all my life, all my life. And I'm delighted that I'm now in a position where I work for the BBC and local radio, been there a long, long time, worked in independent radio for a long, long time. I've experienced racism, I know that, but I've never let it knock me down and I ain't gonna start now. Um, I, I am a confident person and because of that, I can hold an argument or a discussion will go whichever way you want to go. You want an argument, I'm your man whatever it is about. I meet great guests on, on my show. And because of that, I, I have a wide appreciation of people's thinking in many, many areas. Uh, <laughs> can, I, can, I, <laughs> can I just tell you this? Please do, yes. We are all ears here. It's Listen, so the organizer of this. Yes. Just tell me her name, please. Um, Kesra. Kesra. Yeah. I get your name wrong so, all the time. Yeah. She comes in on, as a guest on my show on Sunday Breakfast on BBC yeah. Radio Manchester, and I get her name wrong all the time. But I love when she comes in because she comes in with this waft of awesomeness and great ideas. And I think, you know, for, for the future of all of us, we have to be positive. Yes. We're at a crucial time in our existence now. When you see what's going on in America and other parts of the world, you have to have a positive outlook. And I think that positivity and ideas like this that we're part of today are absolutely fantastic. I absolutely agree. We are so lucky and I mean, all the organizers um, for MacFest, you know, they deserve, I don't, they deserve a clap on the back, a massive round of applause. I'm not sure, something good, <laughs> because it's just such a wonderful event. And I know, like you, I'm sure, um, you, I went along to the events in person in previous years and just the sense of community and inclusion is it's unlike anything I've ever attended before. So it's, um, you know, it's an honor for all of us to be here, I think, so yes. No, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so I'm just going to have a look at some questions and comments. So from Barbara, um, she says, it's great Mike is so confident. There are many who are not, um, who need support. It is in inspirational. I agree, it is really inspirational. How did you get your confidence? Were you born with it? Did you build it? So how did you develop it? Wow, what a question. A, a lovely one. I, I, I was born in the Caribbean, in oh. Grenada. OK, <clears throat> which is a tiny, tiny island way, way down there. Um, my grandfather was, shall we say, well to do. Let's put it like that. I think people will understand that. Um, and we grew up in a great situation when we uh, <clears throat> my father left pretty much as soon as me and my brother were born to go to England to make his fortune. So we stayed with my mum in, in her household, her being her, her father's household. So 10 years later, 10, 11 years later, we moved to England to join my father and her to join her husband. And confidence has never been a problem for me. I'll tell you that for nothing. Aww. If you can't see what I've got to offer, you can't see. I agree. That's I totally agree with that. <laughs> so um, when I, I worked over here, I worked for the post office for years. Um, I then started working in nightclubs and had a great time there. Eventually, I got on the radio at Piccadilly Radio in Manchester, which was one of the best local radio stations in the country. I was there for eight years, had a massive disagreement with them, which nobody believes when I tell the story now. But I I have got very high principles mm. and I stood on a principle and left the radio station with nothing else to go to amazingly. Um, but then another radio station across the city, I went on there to discuss my, my situation and the boss came and met me at the door at the end and effectively said, when do you want to start? And he gave me a job on the spot. And I've been in the media all this time. 
I'm fortunate to be confident in what I do and you may not like me, that's fine. That is fine. There are people who do. And I've had a great career uh, in, in broadcasting, including work on television, but I just keep going, you know, and uh, as I always say, God looks after me because I'm one of his special ones. Um, and one day, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. I understand that. And all I hope is that the work I've done while on this earth, you know, carries me on forever, wherever I end up. I think it will. And I think we can all agree today that we think you're wonderful and we're very lucky to have you. So it has been such a pleasure. Oh, my goodness. Um, and um, so thank you so much, Mike. Um, and um, so I think if we open it up um, and um, go back um, to thinking a little bit about photography as well, because we've got a question from Hanani El Hadoui. Did I, I hope I said that right. Um, and um, they ask just how can photography change um you know what you see um especially kind of thinking through um your own com country and um thinking through um azerbaijan um what do you think thawad how does it change how you see it's a great question um photography um impacts me because i always say uh, i actually spoke to ai weiwei which is one of the best modern artists now out there and he said to me amazing quote, which I still remember, he said to me that photography is like a sea. While we all have photos, but only the best photos or the photos we like always stays in our memory. So it will wash away that stuff, like dirt away, but only like the best thing will stay. And I believe a photography can change people because uh, as you can see in Alan Curtis case in uh, during the refugee campaign, uh, it, also the awareness about the refugees because back then people all knew refugees are the people that come from different countries that was like general stereotype about that but now you have a lot of awareness about the movement that what they're going through the injustice and the uh, barriers they face um, but i believe uh, especially when you are looking at that photograph of children is very very strong uh, visualization of that and and stuff for me and I think for, for a lot of us, um, we don't forget the photos. Uh, there's a certain photos we, we look at it and we just say, okay, that's a photo. But there's a certain kind of photos. Even might be not important for others, but for you will be uh, because it will bring your memories. So that way, in that way, photography will have a huge impact in changing people's uh, um, views on certain stuff. And actually, this is very important to highlight. We are living in a time where there's lots of misinformation about various stuff. And you see a lot of now deep fake videos and a lot of Photoshop photos to discredit people. But uh, you know, that's why I actually, while it's up to every artist to do their own stuff, and I think they have a, um, you know, I support no censorship when it comes to the art, but it's very, very important to keep certain photos real. Because if we change everything about ourselves, we lose ourselves. And I would like to be hated as who I am than being somebody who I am not, you know, because yeah. it's very, very important to focus on that. But I think one of the best things about photography, it captures moments which, when you cannot take back. And, you know, you can, um, you can like, so there's certain stuff we take and that things are gone. And photography is like kind of a legacy. And as Mike said, it, I'd rather be known for my legacy uh, towards changing people's lives than live in a life and take a photo of myself, which people might not find it interesting. And I mean, in, in terms of selfies, not through artistic perspective as somebody doing a project. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that both of you have already created this tremendous legacy. Um, and it must be very inspiring, actually, um, for those who are going to come next, you know, the younger generation um, of, of us, um, who I'm hoping some of us have joined us tonight. So one of the things that I think is quite important is thinking about how we decolonize photography, how we decolonize media, so how we make it accessible um, to black people in the UK and um, to ethnic minority communities in the UK, to all these people who have tremendous talent and have 
you know, have, should have an equal right, but don't perhaps to access to the creative arts. So what do we do? What, what should we do to begin to change and make these, um, you know, these fields more accessible? I believe we should work with a lot of uh, our government as well as lots of groups because there's now a lot of groups that are trying to change towards better. One of the things actually recently was lots of talk about that in, in garden as well that artistic class and music classes is not being funded enough. So it's very important to get a lot of funding because for a lot of people, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, photography and art can change their lives, like the way sports can change uh, people's lives as well. So it's key to work with journalists. And I know it's not easy to get your story across the newspapers. And I have been in the same position, but that's why raising awareness about yourself can change perspectives. Because I remember uh, 20 years ago when I talked about refugees, none of the Scottish newspapers were interested because that they thought it's not very important issue to highlight that. But when there was awareness about that, they completely changed their uh, perspectives. And now uh, they cover more refugee events, I think, than some of the uh, national TVs, which is actually making me happy because there's so much campaign and there's demand for that. And how to do it, like, uh, to change demand is not that difficult, but we need to take action. That's why I always say everything starts with action. And never be, like, scared of discrimination. Like, I can tell you one short story that on social media, somebody uh, said very, like, uh, offensive death threat, in my case, saying that I will come to your house and I will kill you. They told me that. And I said, are you sure you want to, to say it, uh, this to me? They said, no, I am sure I want to come and stab you in your house. And this guy was quite foolish enough to forget that uh, his details apparently was on the internet. And I said, you know, if I look from Racial Relations Act 1965, you, are, you might get 10 years for this uh, sentence because death threat is actually a criminal offense. And the guy will say something that I will never forget. He says, please don't tell me that. And I said, well, as a migrant, I can teach you about this, you know, how to know about people. And you can see how fear came to him. And completely started to back away from his sentence, but it's important to kind of uh, stand your ground uh, when it comes to injustice. And there's an analysis of, especially when we are talking from uh, MacFest, like uh, there's a lot of good um, charities like Tell Mama, which deals with a lot of discrimination because now this social media is rife with like, a, uh, like, like very, very poor comments. Like YouTube commentary box, it's like, you'll see all kind of abuse there. It's very, very important to tackle that. And anybody, not only if you're from Muslim background, need to contact Tell Mama. They are even though designed to tackle Islamophobia, they are open to all kind of like uh, uh, people. And if you feel you are being discriminated, please do speak up because again, you're not only uh, defending yourself, you're defending whole communities and other people. Fantastic. What's your perspective, Mike? Um, how do you think we can begin to decolonize and make sure that all communities feel that they can access media, um, you know, whether they are black, whether they, you know, whatever their backgrounds, but particularly with a focus on increasing inclusion um, for black and ethnic minority communities? I'm not sure I agree with you on the inclusion point because there is now more media than anything else. And all that's happening with some of it is that it's been segregated as well. And people tend to stay in their lanes, which is not right. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. I think that for the future of the world, we have to come together. We just have. When you see what's going on in the States, it's just horrendous, just horrendous. And if people are in their silos and not meeting other people and not going out there and not, you know, then it will only get worse. We have to come together as nations, as the world, and think, how can we help our fellow human beings? What can we do to make their life easier, to bring entertainment to them? And I think when we do that, we will help in a in a great way in a great way i'm from originally as i mentioned before in grenada i'm from grenada i'm just going to try this and see if it comes that background okay was um is a place called harvey vale in 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 Karaku, which is the island that i'm from and i i'd not gone back to the islands 
from coming here until an uncle of mine passed away. And uh, this uncle was a great guy to us, to me and my brother, when we were over there as kids. He was a, probably five or seven years older than we were, maybe even a bit more. And he really looked after us. And he was one of the coolest guys on the island we lived on. So we just moved in his shadow. And when we came, I never saw him again. Uh, in fact, I saw him once. He came over here once. And it was wonderful to see him. And he really inspired me. He was a great believer in thinking your own thoughts. And I wanted to be like him. And when I went back to the islands, I took this photo and it is just one of my favorite photos that I've got. And I've got thousands of photos. I always take pictures. And it is part of Karakou, which is the island off Grenada that we, we're from. And we're so far away from, you know, the other civilizations, you, you can't see them from there. But most people from there go to the US. For us, fortunately, my father came to the UK and after 10 years, he'd raised enough money to, uh, to, to bring us over, my brother and I and our mum. And the future of the world depends on us thinking about other people, caring about others. And if we don't, we will see more and more and more of what's going on in the States at the moment. The splits that are occurring across the world is not going to help anybody. And we have got, got to come together as people, as nations, and think about the rest of the world as well. The sooner we do that, the better it will be for all of us. We have to think about that. And I don't know how we make it happen. I've always been in the media. So I've been lucky enough to have a little bit of an influence in, in the greater Manchester area. And people know me. I did a little bit of national television for the BBC. Um, but I don't know how we bring the world together. I just don't. And I wish somebody would tell me. I think that is abs I absolutely agree. Incredibly profound. And yes, how do we? It's, it's, it's a big question, isn't it? And I think... You know, you're absolutely right, Mike. If we could bring people together, if we can make sure that we're inclusive, then, you know, we could solve so many issues from climate change to, um, you know, to the horrible social issues and the kind of divisiveness um, that we've seen, um, you know, over the past um, few years. And so I think, I think that is such a beautiful and powerful sentiment. So yeah, I agree, definitely. Um, and I think that a lot of that, of course, starts with representation and starts with visibility and knowledge um, and sharing. Um, I mean, again, like you, I do not have the solution. I am a human geographer. I'm lucky enough to have travelled um, and photographed and written and supported, um, you know, to share communities' views. But I wish I had the answer. <laughs> maybe, 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 um, you know, maybe we'll come up with it someday. So... Yes, um, I'm just going to have a little look through um, other questions and comments. So um, you've had so many nice things said about you, both of you, um, kind of thinking about um, kind of how, um, you know, um, how important it is, like you said, to stand stand your ground in the face of injustice, Fouad, um, and um, thinking about also um, kind of how important it is to come together as people and nations. You have literally been quoted. Um, and we've got a lovely comment here um, from Nilofa um, Sheikh. Is that pronounced right or is it Nilofa Sheikh? Um, to you, um, our guests. Um, so she says um, that schools are a great source to bring communities together. However, we need to remove the ghettoization of schools. Um, what do you think? I think so. I believe um, a lot of like, um, some. it all starts from family because that's like where you come and you usually get, uh, from my, uh, at least perspective, uh, if you have some racist parent or relative or stuff like that, it can affect you because especially when you're a child, you think that is okay. Or when you see even in domestic uh, case, uh, violence cases, when if somebody done a lot of like abuse, ch a child might grow up saying, Can, you know, my parents done that, maybe that's okay with me. So it's very important to tackle that. But school also plays a, a lot of role because we form in school. 
And I believe teachers should also play its role because sometimes it's not easy as well for a teacher to uh, to comfort saying to other kids that that is not okay because there is like job security matters comes through. But I believe um, there should be more power given to teachers uh, to support in, uh, to uh, uh, to support uh, what is right. It's not being like trying to change somebody's political perspectives. But if if it's, uh, racism is like an offense, so it needs to be stopped. And unfortunately, a lot of people are scared to discomfort that. And that's why I've been working with Scottish government trying to do racial framework in the workplaces because you see a lot of hidden racism in workplaces. Like somebody named Ali Ahmed will get less opportunities as somebody na uh, named, let's say, John Anderson. Uh, because uh, we need to kind of change this uh, in our country because like, when somebody doesn't get a job, it's not only he doesn't get a job, it affects his family, it affects the whole community. And you will see a lot of people from um, various backgrounds getting far less job opportunities because of their background. While there's been some uh, progress, let's say if you look at the NHS, uh, we need to have that kind of diversity everywhere, not only in NHS or in sports field. We need to have in uh, law, uh, legal system, we need to have that in a special police system which I think needs to be completely reformed um, because you'll see a lot of now uh, abuses, like stop and search was one of the stuff was happening, which I believe should be stopped because people shouldn't be stopped because they look different. People will be, should uh, be searched if there's some kind of good evidence they have done wrong because that leaves trauma, that leaves discrimination. And I'm sure a lot of people maybe face discrimination when you go to the airport. You'll see this guy, will, a lot of people will pass you, but when, if you were different, they will say, hold on, you know, let me check you. Even though you're coming from the same country as him and wearing uh, probably the same clothes, but maybe in different style. But that shouldn't be a case of police searching me and abusing me or racial profiling, which is very important. You need to stop racial profiling um, because that's how harassment starts. That's how things start. And But I would like to see more support uh, uh, um, for the organizations that tackle racial profiling. Becky, your mic's off at the moment. I'll just pick up and say this. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yes, I thank you. And sorry about that. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, racial profiling is such an issue. And I think it's one of those relics, isn't it, from kind of the early 2000s, late 1990s that should have been, should never have been implemented in the first place. Um, and fear was used. I remember I teach this to my students about kind of the politics of the Great War and Terror, which I'm sure you are both familiar with as well, um, and, and kind of that use of fear um, to implement programs like Stop and Search. And um, I totally agree with you, we need to be more loving towards each other, regardless of background, we need to, um, you know, abolish these, um, you know, discriminatory systems. So thank you so much. Um, um, I've also noticed, and um, we've got a, um, another question for Mike, if that's okay. Um, so, um, from Hanane, um, he says, as a broadcaster, what is your personal life mission? So no small questions here. So what is your kind of mission? Um, and saying that she, she's very inspired by you, as we all are today. Well, I've got a simple, simple, I don't know what the word is. I just want to be the best that I can be. Okay, it's really that simple. Um, I remember many years ago when I left school, my dad suggested that I join the RAF. And I thought, great idea, I'll get to fly planes, you know, and I went through the, the, the whole procedure to join the RAF. At the last interview, they said, having passed all the tests to this point, they said they didn't think I would fit in the RAF. And I said, okay, I've never been short of confidence. I knew I would passed all the tests that they put in front of me and somebody's decision was take, made a decision that they didn't want me. For whatever reason, I've ne it's never uh, kept me awake at night. I just move on with my life. I think it's important to have a goal. I wanted to be in the media. I wanted to be a DJ. I went through all of it. I had, you know, down times. I remember working in a nightclub. We'd agreed to do six nights. I'd done two nights and I got there and they said um, they don't want to do it anymore. They paid me for the full six, six nights because it was getting too black. Wow. 
And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. I went to a different club and my fans, for want of a better word, followed me there. The world is changing, not quickly enough. And there are still places as we're seeing from America where massive divisions exist. Somehow we've got to bring the world together. I don't know who's gonna be responsible for it. I don't know if it's gonna happen in my lifetime, but we need to think about this because we cannot go on with these wars and these disagreements, some of it over absolute nonsense. We have to come together as a people and stand up for each other and do the right thing, as somebody once said, all those decades ago. I can't wait for it to happen. Me neither. And that was a beautiful answer. Um, I was, I'm sure we're all pacifists here and in agreement with you. Um, so I've got a technical question for you, um, Fuad. Um, I was wondering, um, and we've also had a question about it as well. What camera did you start off with? And what do you photograph with now? So what was your first camera? Like, did you have one of the um, 35 mil um, or did you have like a digital point and shoot? Where did you start? So um, this is quite, <laughs> I always get this question. It's very cool. <laughs> um, um, but um, thank you. It's, you know, there's no wrong questions. Uh, no. I, I like to answer all. Uh, when I started, I actually bought this cheap camera and I, I remember even the price for it. It was like 60 quid from Lidl. If you are looking for that, it was a basic, uh, we call it like a sometime soapbox camera. You know, the typical camera, you had a flash on it and it was a digital camera. And, but over the time, I, and I always recommend, you should start with, uh, it's not basically about the camera, it's about the photographer. Because uh, sometimes people think if they might have a quite expensive camera that will make them pro photographer, which is actually not true because it's all about you. It's all about your work. There is no right or wrong in photography, technically, because you might like uh, clear photos. I might like blurry photos. It's all about style. It's all about perspective. It's all about technique. But over the time, I uh, bought a Canon 1000D, which is called also Canon Rebel X. I like Canon because it's more difficult. I, I always like to have challenge, you know, <laughs> uh, but... As I like moved forward, now I have Canon 77D, and some people said, oh, you took really good photos with this camera because it's a really, it was an expensive camera out there. They had lots of uh, amazing equipment like Canon Mark, which, which is still actually very popular today. But it's all about um, just like you, you know, like a knife in the hands of the fool can be a very dangerous thing, but in the hand of like a, a chef is a great tool. So it's all about... Uh, um, like learning about it but I always suggest it's quite good to look at other photographers because that, that way you see some of the mistakes you've made and what's the best lesson from photographer I will say try to take as much as photography your first 10,000 photos are your worst photos you know the more you take the more you learn because um, there is a, and recently a lot of film photography became popular especially in a in my country and, and also Asia, I think, like in Azerbaijan and post uh, Russian speaking countries, and even in, in uh, far Asian countries like Japan, uh, which have a very strong photography traditions, you have a lot of uh, people taking in film. But I love taking both in film and I love both taking in digital. For me, it's all about art. And but uh, I especially would like to see comeback of the Polaroid or Kodak photos, you say, because even though we might think they are simplistic. When you're looking at it, see the tint of the photos, that kind of uh, colors, different, because every camera takes different, because it have a different settings. Um, but I always say experiment, learn, uh, also please uh, learn about light and shadow, because this is a like, key foundation towards uh, getting good results. Because if you don't know the angles, uh, it can change a lot. Of, while there's no clear answer, you should get specific angles for every photo. It can make your photo stand out. So it's very, very important to have it. Can I just say, I, I take hundreds of photos. Um, I've had cameras all my life and I'm not looking to get the world's greatest photo. I took take and took photos to remind me of something. That's all. This photo in the background of mine now was when I went back to the Caribbean for my uncle's funeral. And I took my wife, who's a, a, an English woman, and 
we went back there together and I showed her all the places where I grew up and we took pictures. And, and this one is in a place called Harvey Vale, which is just somewhere we used to go. The sea there is beautiful, always stuff going on there, great food being cooked. And I take photographs to remind me of situations. And I think if you do that, you will grow to love photography because you will look at them in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, and it will remind you of that moment. I absolutely agree. And I think, I think almost photography as a memory um, is a really interesting concept as we all become kind of mobile phoned up because we're becoming better at it. We're getting kind of a better opportunity to document and to reflect upon our lives. And I know um, some people probably don't enjoy it that much, but I always like my, um, I say my bad photos or my informal photos that aren't taken professionally. And I love the way that um, on my Google Drive, um, on my phone, it pops up every now and again with like some little um, snapshot of what I was doing a few years ago. Um, and, you know, it gives you that moment, doesn't it, to kind of be sentimental and like well, reflect. So. I think where people make a mistake is they don't print out their photos. They remain yeah. in the phone or wherever. Print it out, put it up around your house. It will remind you of moments in time. That's wonderful advice. Oh, sorry, yes. I completely agree with that because if you look at our families, if you notice that there's not so much family photos, again, might be some families, but some of the people might not be there in future. But when you look at it back, as Mike said, it's all about you because photography becomes part of you. It's basically you contribute to photography and photography to contributes to you. So it's a really good investment. And also, like, there's uh, one thing I like to touch. Uh, we sometimes don't like our photos, like, now, but you might like in five, ten years. So please do not be hard, like, please do not, like, uh, rush to delete your photos because uh, people's perspective change. I had some photos which I really dislike uh, about myself, but in five years, I said, whoa, that is an amazing photo that I have took. And it's all about the angles as well because sometimes my this side uh, might look uh, different than this side, even though they are different but in when you're taking a photograph from different angles it's quite important to get from various points so experiment is very very important in photo again more very good advice and i know what you mean i reflect upon my old photos probably for a wrong reason and go oh i was thin then um, in my case <laughs> But yeah, um, I totally agree. We should keep them and reflect upon them and print them down and frame them more than we do. Um, so I use glass frames, yeah, if I may add. Because <laughs> glass, they use glass frames because yeah. it's again to keep dust away because sometimes when you have dust in photos, I mean, you might lose the quality. So please, it's not expensive. That is again, excellent advice. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, Mike and Fuad, you have been fascinating brilliant um i feel like i've learned so much just kind of being in your company for the last hour and a half and getting to enjoy both your talks um, and i'm sure our audience has too it's been an absolute pleasure um i just wanted to mention a comment actually that i thought was really um well, there was a few comments that kind of i think resonate with us um and that you'll appreciate hearing so one's from kim nagan and um she says, thanks so much for sharing your stories. I fell victim to anti-Asian hate harassment during the COVID-19 pandemic because of my Asian appearance. So she's really appreciated and, you know, and enjoyed being able to engage with our talk today. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I, I am in a position of privilege. I can't imagine what it is. Well, my tiny experience of racism was during Brexit because I am a my heritage is Latvian Russian, so I'm half Latvian Russian, and I used to live in the Polish bit of Southampton while I did, was doing my PhD, and I got told to go back home by a you know man in a white van, to which I was like, it's down the road, you know, um, but uh, that is it, which is nothing compared to what people have experienced, right? Um, and um, but it gave you know it gave a taster to me of what it must be like, um, and being from you know refugee descendants myself, and obviously you have that kind of you about empathy, I think. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that, Kim. Um, another comment that I um, appreciated was from Barbara, um, who was, um, I'm just scrolling up to find it again. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your patience. Um, um, so she said um, that she's the daughter of Jewish refugees. Um, and again, this is, and she said, this is why she's involved in MacFest, because you know, it's so inclusive. Um, and that um, you were brilliant as usual. So, so you have, um, 
a, um, you have a track record that you're maintaining, Mike. <laughs> so I thought you'd like to hear that. Um, and um, it goes back many, many decades in this yes. year on the radio and television. So uh, thank you very much indeed for that. No, thank you so much. So we've got five minutes left. Um, so is there anything um, that you, either of you would like to share um, or anybody would like to share to conclude tonight's wonderful event? Thank you so much, I'll say now, to everybody who has helped put this event together. I feel very privileged to be able to introduce and um, you know, provide idle chatter um, and ask some good questions. Um, but really, um, you know, Kasira, um, Fuad, Mike, um, everybody, Mariam, um, I, you know, it's been it's been amazing. So it's been such a pleasure to be able to kind of help facilitate. Um, but as you were saying, you know, any final words for our audience tonight? Well, my final words is to thank you, to be honest, for being an absolutely fantastic host. Absolutely brilliant the way you've handled this. It's uh, it's not easy doing the job that you've just done and keeping it interesting and keeping it moving on. And thanks also to Fuad for uh, his photos, which we saw during his presentation. And I love great photos. I've always said this because they are moments in time that live forever. That's it, that moment. I go back to some of my very old photos and I immediately transported back to that point in time. So uh, take as many pictures as you can is always my advice. You, you can never take too many photos. Thank you so much, Becky and Mike and Fuad for an amazing, riveting discussion. So goodbye and assalamu alaikum everyone. See you tomorrow if you can, one o'clock with Liverpool, MacFest City College. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs>